My name is Greg Mullins, and in a moment, I will introduce Silo Radovsky, who in turn will introduce our speaker this evening. I know many of you in the room who attend the Critical and Creative Theory Lecture Series. This Monday night series assembles three or four coordinated studies programs for shared lectures on topics that cut across our respective inquiries. The lectures are open to the campus community, as I see tonight. We have a strong turnout. Good to see you. If this is your first evening with us at one of our lectures, welcome. And please join us one week from tonight in the recital hall at 5.30 to hear Elizabeth Williamson speaking under the title, Society Must Be Defended, Biopower and Necropower in Titus Andronicus. I'd like to welcome to the stage Silo Radovsky, who's a graduating senior and a frequenter of CCT lectures, who works at the crossroads of creative and critical writing. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Cool. My name is Silo, and I am a student here at Evergreen. It is a tremendous honor to introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Elaine Scarry. She comes to us from Harvard University, where she is the Walter M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and the General Theory of Value. She has authored many notable books, including On Beauty and Being Just, The Body and Pain, and most recently, Thermonuclear Monarchy. The topics of her inquiry include representation and embodiment, literature and poetics, and what might fall under the broad umbrella of civics. In her writing, Professor Scarry draws upon a diverse range of evidence. Literature, classical philosophy, popular culture, and politics are all brought to bear upon her subject matter. Ekphrastically interpreting contemporary cultural artifacts, she calls our attention to decipher what is there as well as what is absent. One might even consider thinking in an emergency, required reading for all students newly entering into Evergreen next fall, as a trial of the Western philosophical tradition's ability to deliver its promise of concrete democratic social arrangements. She writes about all these subjects with clarity and cohesion, making the internal logics of her texts accessible by building her arguments in layers or concentric circles, and never allowing her reader to drift too far from the center never drifting away from what is at stake. To describe her canon as thematically diverse obscures the interconnectedness of her inquiries. The analogy of layers and concentric circles could also be applied to the range of subject matters which she has explored. Matters of dialogue and perception are examined at multiple levels and locations. The range of texts which Professor Scarry has penned implicitly reveals the connection between poetics and politics, as she both analyzes and engages in the influence that the humanities and the human voice more broadly have to matters of large social import. She argues that such subjective and collaborative modes, rather than being ill-suited for the serious stuff, are actually by their very nature poised to do the necessary work of addressing this heavy matter. One question that certainly remains, and which is perhaps alluded to in thinking in an emergency, is what modes of listening allow for such dialogue to become meaningful. With the calm clarity mimicked by her writing style, Professor Scarry has advocated for thoughtfulness in the face of urgency. Examples of such socially pressing issues addressed by her writing include torture, large-scale catastrophes, and the incomprehensibly destructive potential of atomic bombs. As she has argued, the nature of grave social matters doesn't restrict us from engaging with them thoroughly and thoughtfully. In fact, instead of being overshadowed by crises, it is often in such moments that models of thinking established by habit reveal themselves, when that which is below the surface is made visible. In our own thinking about social emergencies and the events of the past two weeks in Baltimore, and not just Baltimore, are a reflection of chronic, long-standing emergencies we can take a cue in this regard from Professor Scarry. With all that remains unsaid or unheard, one might wonder where to begin. 
In an introduction to 1994's Resisting Representation, Professor Scary said this about the impossible task of pulling experience into the recalcitrant form of language. It may, once we are inside the writer's sentences, again be the extraordinary resourcefulness, the expansive ingenuity of the human voice that we hear. That she has turned her own voice to these matters is something that we can all be grateful for. Her thorough and methodical texts have laid the groundwork to expand upon what can be said about physical pain, mutual aid in emergencies, and beauty as a force which moves us into action rather than distracts us from the harsh stuff of life. To extrapolate from her book, The Body in Pain, a model of thinking through which to understand how visceral experiences are, or are not, made shareable and expressible, including, as she does, the pain inflicted upon bodies through social arrangements, we can see that there is something essential that such an inquiry never strays too far from its physical rooting in the body. This liminal space between body and word, and what is made sensible through it, seems to perfectly highlight the meaning of aesthetics, and by proxy, it's important to our shared and individual physical realms. I look forward to what she has to say on beauty and social justice. Please join me in welcoming Professor Elaine Scary to Evergreen. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I have many people here to thank for very rich days over the past two days. Um, but for the moment, I'll thank Greg for getting me here on time and for introducing Silo and Silo for her wonderful introduction, her description of thinking in emergency as putting Western civilization on trial has made me understand my own book better. So I'm appreciative of that. I want to speak this afternoon about the way in which beauty presses us to a greater concern with justice. Both beauty and justice have, a, in English, a shared synonym, which is the word fairness. In the realm of beauty, we speak of fair skies and fair vistas and fair faces. But also in the realm of justice, we speak about fair arrangements and a fair playing field. It may be surprising to be reminded that the word fair, as in fair play and fair practices, comes etymologically from the aesthetic word fairness, meaning loveliness of countenance or precision of fit. Both beauty and justice also have injury as their opposite term. In the case of justice, this is literally the case. The second syllable of the word injury is the same root as in justice. And injury is, I believe, the most accurate opposite to beauty. When we speak about beauty, whether a poem by John Keats or a painting by Matisse or a lover's face or a mathematical proof, or the structure of the atom, we are speaking about three different sites. And at each of them, the connection between beauty and justice can be glimpsed. Often when we speak about beauty, we're speaking about the beautiful thing itself, the face of Dante's Beatrice, or a Greek vase, or the rainforest um, here at this school. And we talk about the beauty of the object in terms of certain attributes such as symmetry, clarity, color, vivacity, or unity. So the first sight of beauty is the beautiful object itself. In the second sight of beauty, we're speaking not about the object, but about the perceptual event that happens to us when we come into the presence of the beautiful object. And, and there have been hundreds of such accounts. Uh, one early one is the account of Socrates saying that when he comes into the presence of the beautiful boy, his knees buckle, he breaks into a sweat, his shoulder blades itch because he's beginning to grow feathers that will carry him back to the immortal, um, immortal world. The third sight of beauty, again, involves the perceiver, but this time it's not what happens to the perceiver in the first split second of coming into the presence of beauty, but in the minutes or hours or even days and weeks the aftermath um, of seeing beauty, and what happens in that aftermath is an act of creation. So now I'm going to back up to each of those three sites 
and recall to you what you probably already know, namely the way in which each of them presses us towards a greater concern with beauty. So back to the first sight, the beautiful object, which it might be a vase, a flower, a child's face, a painting, a molecular structure, a poem. Attributes such as symmetry or vivacity anticipate parallel but much more difficult to attain attributes in the realm of justice. The symmetry of a beautiful face or a beautiful equation anticipates John Rawls's definition of justice as fairness, in which he says fairness requires a symmetry in all our relations with one another. Today, Rawls's theory of justice is one of the most widely known accounts of justice, but it's difficult to find any account of justice that does not similarly stress the principle of symmetry, whether it's Plato talking about the necessity of finding punishments that are symmetrical to crimes, or the way we talk today about the way in which compensation ought to be symmetrical with the work people do, or if we take a much more um, unusual definition of <coughs> justice, such as David Hume's account of the way in which um, expectations ought to be symmetrical with the fulfillment. Um, so that's the first sight of beauty. Symmetry can be seen in beauty, and it presses us towards symmetry in the realm of justice. Now let me go to the second sight of beauty, where it's not the object itself, but the cognitive event that happens when one suddenly comes into the presence of the object. Of the hundreds of accounts uh, we've gotten over many centuries, two of the most striking are given by two mid-20th century women philosophers, Iris Murdoch and Simone Weil, who both speak about the unselfing or radical decentering we experience when we come into the presence of beauty. Iris Murdoch gives the example of being in a state of self-preoccupation, worrying about her work, or worrying about whether her status has been fully enough recognized and appreciated, and then suddenly seeing a bird lift off the ground and move into flight. She says that at that moment, all one's self-absorption falls away, and one undergoes an unselfing. The French philosopher and mystic Simone Weil referred to this phenomenon as a radical decentering, because we're suddenly swept to the sidelines of the world we had been occupying. Now, I refer to this state as a state of opiated adjacency, and here's why I like this very lumpy term. There are many things in life that put us in a state of acute pleasure, and there are many things in life that make us feel marginal or lateral or on the sidelines. But what is deeply and abidingly extraordinary about beautiful things is that they do these two things at once. They put us in a state of bliss at the very moment that they make us feel marginal or secondary, happy to be in a supporting rather than a central role. None of us is the center of the world, but each of us can get into the mistake of believing that we're the center of our own world. Beauty relieves us of this. It not only puts us on the sidelines, but amazingly makes us acutely happy to be there on the sidelines. Becoming capable of experience bliss in one's own lateralness may not be itself a state of justice, but it certainly prepares us for doing such work in the world. Murdoch arrives at her account of beauty by asking, what is it that helps us to become good? Not what, us le what lets us talk about being good, but what actually makes us good? And she says, of all things in the world, the thing that's best at this is the thing we commonly refer to as beauty. Now I'm going to move to the third site of beauty, the aftermath, where one is speaking again of the perceiver, but this time the perceiver in enduring moments after coming into the presence of what is beautiful. Diotima told Socrates, who told Plato, who tells us, that the beauty of the face of the person you love gives rise to the desire to bring children into the world. But Diotima says that beautiful persons and things not only prompt the creation of children, but the creation of poems, plays, legal treatises, and works of philosophy. 20th century philosophers agree with Diotima and Socrates and Plato. 
What is it, Wittgenstein asks, that happens to us when we stand in the presence of a beautiful cathedral or boy or flower? He answers, when the eye sees something beautiful, the hand wants to draw it. I might have thought that this third sight, which emphasizes the phenomenon of creation, might be more true in the humanities than in math or science. So I was interested when I heard a lecture about beauty in math by Robert Langland, um, when he opened his lecture by saying, quote, math must be pregnant with possibility and endure for millennia. So there right away was that sense of the fertility of beauty. And Mario Livio, a senior astrophysicist at the Hubble Laboratories, um, talked about the way in which math mathematicians had seen all the exciting things that came out of the discovery of cubic and quadratic equations. And so they anticipated with great delight uh, what would come of quintic equations. So again, this idea that it's not just the thing itself, but the fertility that comes along with the thing. Now, instead of the word creation, it is, in my judgment, useful to use the much more prosaic word replication because that second word reminds us how widespread this impulse is. There may be very great outcomes, uh, such as a new child or a new piece of architecture or a breakthrough in mathematical thinking, something we would all recognize as great act of creation. But the same impulse is evident if one sees something beautiful and wants to take a photograph of it or tell a friend about it or simply stand and perpetuate the moment of seeing for 20 seconds more, that is, keeping it within one's own perceptual horizon. These everyday outcomes are also acts of creation. They are counterfactual. They bring into being something that wasn't the case before. Now, how is this incitement to creation yoked to justice? It is in, in two ways. Um, first, beauty may be either natural or artifactual. Beauty can occur in a field of wildflowers or in a manicured garden or in a painting, Monet's painting, for example, of that field of wildflowers. But justice, in contrast, is always artifactual. It always requires human acts of intervention and creation. Anything, therefore, which puts us in touch with our own powers of creation is itself a contribution to the ongoing aspiration for justice. The philosopher David Hume is one of um, a number of people who have emphasized this point. Hume said that natural virtues need to have some benign outcome in order to be good, whereas artificial virtues or artifactual virtues need have no immediate visible outcome since the mere exercise of our capacity for the artifactual is a good outcome. The second way in which beauty by at once awakening us to our capacity for the artifactual contributes to justice is simply that it is tied to the desire to bring more and more into the world so that there will eventually be enough. That impulse towards plenitude has been given many uh, names. It may be understood as it was in earlier centuries as infinity or caritas, um, but it can also be understood in the language we use today, the language of distribution. So this third site is important both because it incites us to the exercise of the artifactual um, and also because it's bound up with a pressure towards distribution that makes the making of more and more so there will eventually be enough. I know that anyone coming to a gathering about beauty has a yearning for visual image, uh, images and I will soon put a couple of up on the screen. I have so far abstained from doing so because I want the truth of each statement I speak to be tested against an object that each of you holds to be beautiful, the face of your own beloved or your own child, the flower you yourself look forward to most each spring, the painting or photograph or piece of fabric you return to most often. The plurality of beautiful objects is one of their key features. But for now, let me return <clears throat> to the three sites of beauty. And this time, I will cordially supply images that appear to me um, compelling or unmistakable in their beauty. And if they don't seem so to you, then you should just substitute a different um, image than the one I'm giving you.
the feature of symmetry is, oh, and I should say that it would have, in, in trying to show the way in which beauty presses us towards justice, I might have a temptation to choose photographs or paintings that have in their content depictions of justice. But that would be loading, that would be uh, assuring that I got the right answer. So instead, what I've taken are um, pictures that are um, either abstract or abstain from any overt social content um, at all, simply to suggest the way they press us towards beauty. So this is um, a work by Josiah McElhaney um, in the, Modern Muse the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it's called Modernity Mirrored and Reflected Infinitely. You can see right away how crucial the feature of symmetry is. Each vessel is itself balanced, and it exists in a balanced relation which, with each of the other um, vessels. And the, even the smoothness of the surface of each vessel is an example of symmetry, since Augustine points out that if you translate equality or symmetry, into the, the, a, a felt texture. It is the texture of smoothness. But you can also see that not only the first sight of beauty, but the second and third sights of beauty are also there. The work um, puts us in mind of on selfing. If you were standing in front of this, and if you go to MoMA, you'll always see a small group of people standing around this very beautiful work, which is far more beautiful than the, the image um, that I'm showing you here. Uh, and the interesting, one of the interesting things about it is that though it consists of many mirrored surfaces, you yourself are not reflected in that surface. So you undergo an unselfing uh, in the presence of it. You're simply not there. Also, obviously, the principle of replication is there since we see 18 or 20 iterations of what's in the small cabinet as we move backwards. This next picture is by Shiro Kuramata. It's his 1988 chair called Miss Blanche. It's one of 350 chairs in the Museum of Modern Art. This particular photograph was taken by Mitsumasa Fujitsuka from the 1998 tour of Kuramata's work by the Hara Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. In its clarity, in what Aquinas calls its claritas, it seems to stand forth and break all frames of reference at the very moment that it also conjures up a plentiful world. It bodies forth its immediate namesake, Miss Blanche of Tennessee Williams streetcar named Desire, the ever bright electric light of male and female sexuality. It is Kuramato's salute, his generous salute to Blanche, Blanche Dubois, uh, his assurance to her that she will never fade just as within the play um, Mitch assures her that she will always be light as a feather. But we can also move further back in time to more immediate precedence. It conjures up the inlaid flowers of Joseph Hoffman or Rene McIntosh, particularly the embedded ivory roses of Rene McIntosh's white tables and chairs. I don't have a picture of it here, but um, you can extrapolate from this and if, imagine what that precedent is like. And if we move even further back in time, it can remind us of um, 17th through 19th century Japanese in-row boxes, tiny tiered compartments for medicine or cosmetics with veneers or inlays or incrustations of chrysanthemums, poppies, clover, or wisteria. In the roses, Floating in acrylic or plastic, we have a magical blend of the world of nature and a material that after 1950 was often spoken about with contempt, that is plastics, um, a material which in uh, the recent lifetimes has been sometimes raised to um, a heavenly space in such a way that it spills over and alters our perception of every other um, piece of this material. Uh, in, and in the way that artworks often can modify our reaction to things. But Kuramata's Miss Blanche or other chairs that he's made, such as this one, which is called Glass Chair, um, which is, as I think you can see, made of six sheets of glass, um, or also this one, which is known as How, How High the Moon, um, are invoked 
primarily for the general way the three sites of beauty process beyond ourselves. One of Kuramato's commentators, Tadashi Yokoyama, makes the startling comment in speaking of Miss Blanche that the effects that come with sitting in the miraculous chair, that's his term, miraculous chair, can be equally achieved just by looking at it. This is a strange claim about a chair, yet the very unselfing beauty brings about makes it irrelevant whether it accommodates one's own body, um, just as the unselfing was apparent in the ease with which we accommodate or we adjust to the absence of our own reflection in McElhaney's modernity mirrored and reflected infinitely. So in Miss Blanche or in How High the Moon, the second site is memorialized inside the work itself. That is, even though I originally started by saying the first site of beauty is in the object, the next two are in the perceiver, in modern artworks we get the uh, you know, metapoetic analysis that incorporates those two into the artwork itself. So we see the unselfing right in the artwork as we also see the um, repetition there. This is what Kuramata himself said about the chair. This piece, this mesh piece expresses a plane that barely holds itself up after all excess parts have been subtracted from the board. This is why people call me a minimalist, but I sometimes also do the very opposite. When steel mesh is surfaced with chrome enamel, it shines and seems to proliferate. I'm working out a process of subtracting and multiplying at the same time. The concept of decoration is weak inside me, but by using mesh that proliferates like a cell within the process of eliminating, I'm discovering my own style of decoration. Built into the object is the very phenomenon that at the outset, I said, had been on the outside, here brought back into the inside. Now, I want to say um, a bit more about unselfing, I mean about um, symmetry, because it is sometimes said to be uh, a feature that, that when I speak about beauty, people don't really believe. That is, when I say that unselfing of beauty, um, when I talk about the unselfing of beauty, I think people uh, immediately recognize what it is I'm talking about, and I, I, I hope that you do. So too, when I talk about creation or replication, I think that's something that we can at once recognize, if only in our excitement to stand a few minutes longer in front of modernity mirrored and reflected infinitely, or to tell the friends about the color of a particular azalea or rhododendron you saw on the way to this um, lecture. But um, people seem to have a much more difficult time believing me um, when they, I talk about symmetry. No one thinks that Iris Murdoch is being metaphorical when she talks about um, on selfing. And I think that when we uh, stand in the presence of something beautiful and can feel our own fingertips tingling to draw a picture of it, we, uh, we, we don't think that the idea of creation is something metaphorical. But when I say that, that the concrete attributes of the object press us towards justice, people often tell me that I'm being metaphorical um, and that I don't even need to make this argument. But I need to make the argument because I think it's true. Um, and so I want to just uh, take a moment more to tell you that I at least believe I'm being literal. Now, in terms of anecdotal statements by poets and philosophers, we have lots of evidence that symmetry presses them towards justice. Um, for example, Wordsworth, in a poem that many of you know, Tintern Abbey, asks, what is the effect of seeing the ruins of Tintern Abbey, these symmetrical structures standing up? And he says that these beauteous forms have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. In other words, it's not as though I was blind when I looked at the, these. And he goes on to say that they bring the kind of pleasure, and now I'm quoting, as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. That's a very famous line in that poem, his little, unremembered, um, nameless acts of kindness and of love. Where do they come from? Wordsworth says they come from looking at the beautiful forms. 
uh, the beautiful acts of symmetry. That's at the beginning of the 19th century, and an example occurs from the end of the 19th century in Hardy's poem at, called At a Lunar Eclipse, in which he describes seeing the beautiful spherical shadow of the Earth on the face of the, um, of the moon. Think of the moon that you probably saw last night, and now uh, imagine the, the, the um, sphere of the Earth beginning to come over it and cover it. And Hardy says, when I see the beauty of the shape of the Earth on the moon, I, re I realize how unbeautiful what we're doing back on the planet is. So here's, here's that part of the poem. Thy shadow, Earth, from pole to central sea, now steals along the moon's meek shine in even monochrome and curving line of imperturbable serenity. How shall I link such sun-cast symmetry with the torn, troubled form I know as thine, that profile placid as a brow divine with continents of moil and misery. So the, the shadow of the earth looks like the forehead of a god to Hardy, uh, but the earth um, does not seem uh, as uh, like the, something that belongs to a god. Now, I think that the skepticism about the um, pressure that um, symmetry exerts in the, in the realm of beauty comes from uh, the time lag that, that occurs. Um, Plato said that beauty, justice, and goodness all come into the world together, but beauty has a special generosity, which is that it's sensorially present. It's in the bowl of space we occupy. Um, we can see it within the sensory horizon, whereas justice and goodness are much more, often much more abstract. Um, justice has to do not just with what's happening in this room, but what's happening in this room in relation to what's happening in Baltimore um, and what's happening in former Yugoslavia, uh, former Yugoslavia or the Ukraine um, or Bagram or, or Guantanamo or, or whatever. And therefore, it doesn't occupy the same... Um, the same kind of uh, concrete immediacy. So there are two different accounts that can be given of the time lag. It might be the case that the aspiration for symmetry comes into being in the realm of beauty earlier than it comes into being in the realm of justice. Or it may be that they both come into being at the same time, but beauty acquires a material realization far in advance of when justice does. And let me give you a quick example of, of each. An example of the first of them, of beauty coming into the world earlier, uh, of symmetry coming into the world earlier than symmetry and justice would be Augustine's work De Musica, where he talks, he, he celebrates equality or symmetry as the highest principle there is. He talks about the beauty of um, symmetry or equality in human faces, in dance steps, in smooth textures, in cakes, um, and most of all, in God. So he's talking about equality. He is not, as far as I can see, talking about racial or class equality. Uh, he is not talking about justice as we know it. And yet, by appreciating the beauty of this thing, he is preparing the ground for what will come uh, much later. The second alternative that I gave you, where um, both of them come into the world at the same time, is, um, is illustrated by the fact that Plato talked about, of course, about symmetry and beauty, such as in the s perfect sphere that Parmenides described as the most beautiful of all shapes. Um, but Plato also talked about the need for symmetry in punishments um, and, uh, and crimes and punishments, that they ought to match each other. Now, the beauty of the this, this sphere, of Parmenides' sphere, was present in Plato's time, and it's present in our time. The symmetry of crimes and punishments was not present in Plato's time. That's why I was worried about it. And it is certainly not present today. Um, so this thing we still don't have right about justice. I don't think there's probably been a day since 9-11 when we haven't expressed our collective bafflement about what would constitute uh, a kind of symmetry of um, punishments and, and rewards. Um, and, uh, and, and one can elaborate the many phenomena that have come up in both the um, student seminars 
today and the faculty seminars that I've participated in. I think that one of the reasons why there was from, for several decades a taboo against beauty in universities, in art museums, in art studios, in architecture um, studios, was actually a taboo about symmetry, <clears throat> a kind of belief that asymmetry was much more interesting. And asymmetry is interesting in moderate doses, in, t in very small doses. It's very, very interesting. People often tell me that asymmetrical faces are the most beautiful, and asymmetrical faces are very beautiful. If it's 99.99% symmetrical and then uh, you know, a tiny percent asymmetrical, if the person has been hit by a roadside bomb in their face, it's not beautiful. If they have bone cancer in their face, it's not beautiful. So we're talking about tiny, tiny amounts of asymmetry. Why do, how, did we then move to this point where so many people would talk about asymmetry being so interesting and symmetry being a big bore? Well, part of it may be that if we ever had to face up to the luxurious asymmetrical position we in the United States are living in, we would have to mend our ways. And you know the kind of figures that I can easily cite. One percent of the world's people own 40 percent of the wealth. Twenty percent of the population own 80 percent of the wealth. Um, one United Nations Human Development Report points out that the United States um, country, that in the United States there was a, a ratio of uh, three to one going from the richest to the poorest in 1820. Uh, three to one, and by the year 2000, the ratio was 75 to one. And if you look at the ratio within specific countries, it's 419 to one. So symmetry, we, we, if we, if we really wanted to care about symmetry, uh, we'd have to mend many of our ways. And if that's an asymmetry in money and the power that comes with money, that's a small asymmetry compared to what exists in the realm of um, weaponry, a point that I'll elaborate in a few minutes. During the decades when beauty was banished from universities, art museums, art studios, etc., the one place where it remained was, of course, advertising. Um, and I have no objection to the fact that advertisers use beautiful persons and scenes to sell things, but in isolation, it leads to a deeply mistaken idea. It seems to say, when you see something beautiful, buy it. But centuries of philosophers and poets and mathematicians tell us something very different. When you see something beautiful, begin to repair the injuries of the world. The beautiful things we encounter in the classroom every day um, call on us to act on behalf of justice. Now, my subject is in part today the um, pact of aliveness that exists between beautiful things and the perceivers of beauty. My subject is the way beauty calls on us to repair the injuries of the world and where possible to eliminate the injuries before they, um, they occur. And the things that we study in the classroom as well as the natural world not only provide us with many, so many different instances of the beautiful that I needn't really be providing examples, they also provide us with so many instances of injustice that it might seem I don't need to provide an example, that each of us can just go out into the world and, um, and, and address whichever injustice strikes us as in most in need of repair. Um, but as you can guess, I'm not going to abstain from talking about one particular injustice. Um, and that's because it's a site of injury so massive, so grave, and simultaneously so unseen that I hope it will be eventually taken on by all of us working collectively. And that is, of course, the problem of nuclear weapons. So in the time I have left, I will attempt to describe three things. First, the terrible scale of our nuclear weapons and our arrangements for presidential first use. Second, the chorus of voices coming from people around the world pleading with us to eliminate this arsenal. Third, the source of our own obligation to rid the world of these and the specific reliance on the beautiful as a kind of call to attend to that work. There's something called the duty to justice argument that I think you might be familiar with. Um, Plato, so Plato Socrates talks about it. Um, 
Others up to John Rawls talk about it. And the duty to justice argument says, you have an obligation to support just laws where they exist. And you have an obligation to try and repair uh, or to bring into being just arrangements where they don't yet exist, especially if you can do that without risking your life or risking getting injured by doing it. Um, and and I'll, I, eventually I'll get to two very magnificent pieces of visual graphic art that, um, that call on us uh, to, to, uh, to uh, repair the problem of nuclear uh, weapons. And these were both pieces of graphic art invented in the 20th century, and perhaps one of you will create uh, the graphic that will, um, will call to us out to people in the um, 21st century. So first of all, the problem, and some of you are already very conversant with this, but um, let me say it quickly for those who aren't. Uh, so the technological readiness of the United States to retract life from beneath the floor of the world's inhabitants. Our, country, um, our country's nuclear arsenal includes, but is by no means limited to 14 Ohio-class submarines. Each carries the equivalent in injuring power to 4,000 Hiroshima blasts. Each one of the 14 ships has enough power to destroy the people and flowers and birds and animals of an entire continent. Uh, to do this as a solo performance without the assistance of the 13 other ships. The precise arithmetic of this blast power can be hard to keep in mind, but one pair of numbers is easy to hold on to. The Earth has seven continents. The United States has 14 Ohio-class submarines. The United States population often imagines that this arsenal came into being during the Cold War with Russia and that its importance ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. But of the 14 Ohio-class submarines, eight came into being after the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's USS West Virginia, USS Kentucky, USS Maryland, USS Nebraska, USS Rhode Island, USS Maine and USS Wyoming, and then last of all, USS Louisiana, each christened and commissioned with the words, man this ship and bring her to life. These eight ships, just the eight made since the opening of the Berlin Wall, um, carry the equivalent of 34,000 Hiroshima bombs. Each, each ship alone holds within its sleek contours eight times the blast power expended by allied and Axis countries in World War II. Um, that is, if you took the blast power of that which was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the 67 Japanese cities that were firebombed, the dropping of the firebombing of Leipzig and Dresden, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the nightly bombing of London, six years of artillery fire on beaches, woodlands, hillside, and cities, um, and now you multiply that by eight, that's what um, each of the submarines holds. I'll just make three quick postscripts. We have sea-based, land-based, and air-based delivery systems of nuclear weapons. I've just told you the sea-based one, which is the smallest of the three. The second postscript is that our nuclear uh, weapons are in a state of constant practice and constant readiness, something that I can elaborate at length if anyone wants to hear it. And the third point is that we now have um, arranged for under uh, the recent President um, George W. Bush and continued by Obama, 12 new Ohio-class submarines on the drawing board, the first of which will be completed by 2021 and the last of which will be completed by 2035. I a moment ago um, said uh, or ought to have noted that the christening and commissioning of our eight new nuclear submarines during the 1990s largely went unreported. Also unreported during this time, and here I'm getting to my second point, that the world's people are asking us uh, for help to, to rid the world of this problem. Also unreported during this time was the fact that in 1995, 78 countries went to the International Court of Justice and pleaded with the court to have nuclear weapons declared illegal. Um, that included Islamic countries like Qatar. It included countries that didn't yet have nuclear weapons, um, such as Iran, North Korea, and India, um, all three of which said, if you don't 
declare these illegal and get rid of them, we're going to be in the position where we have to, um, we have to get them. And these 78 countries made eloquent arguments drawing on the Geneva Protocols, Hague Conventions, uh, St. Petersburg, Convention Against Genocide, the Rio and Vienna declarations on preserving the environment, the ozone layer, and so on and so forth. The United States, in a joint statement made by the Department of Defense and the Department of State, argued having nuclear weapons, threatening to use nuclear weapons, using nuclear weapons, using nuclear weapons first, does not violate Geneva, does not violate Hague, does not violate St. Petersburg, does not even violate the conventions on genocide, since though we acknowledge that millions of people would be killed, it would not be the intent to eliminate a specific um, race or religion, and did not violate the conventions on the um, environment. And though this case went on for um, many days, it was um, never front page news in the United States, or page 15 news, um, or page 25, uh, news and um, and and also unheard are the voices coming from the uh, the southern hemisphere, which is blanketed with um, nuclear weapons free zones arranged for by treaties such as the 1996 Treaty of Perlindaba, uh, the 1995 Treaty of Bangkok, the Treaty of Tataloka, the Treaty of Rarotonga. Uh, the seabed treaty. If you look even on wiki for uh, nuclear free zones, you will see that the whole southern hemisphere is etched out in blue. That means they're nuclear free. And the uh, whole northern hemisphere is made up of red countries, meaning they're nuclear states. Um, and it, it's, it's important to um, hold on to the fact that of, uh, of of six, uh, almost 1,700 weapons in existence today, um, close to 1,600 of them are owned by Russia and the United States. The word nuclear weapon will sometimes occur in the media, but only w so we can debate whether Iran or Iraq or North Korea does or does not have one nuclear weapon, while we never refer to the fact that we have thousands and thousands that are mated to the delivery vehicles and where the targets um, have already been ass assigned specific, um, specific weapons. Now, the contrast to that is in the fact that Plato, that poets and philosophers and art theorists have over millennia seen beauty as a life pact. Um, Homer in the Odyssey um, has Odysseus arrive and see the beautiful Nausicaa, and he describes himself as having uh, undergone a life-saving uh, act that, that he, from, because he's been rescued from the man-killing sea. St. Augustine in De Musica talks about beauty as a life-saving plank in the midst of the ocean. The poet, the, the poet Dante, uh, when he saw Beatrice's face, he know, you know that he wrote The Divine Comedy, but he also wrote a book called The New Life, that is, it's, beauty is life-saving. The poet Rilke, in a poem called The Archaic Torso of Apollo, says when you see something beautiful, it says to you, you must change your life. Um, Kant, in the third critique um, of judgment, stresses the feature of aliveness, um, as the, the uh, philosophic scholar Rudolf McCreel um, has made me aware. Um, the same is true of scientists, Mario Livio, uh, the astrophysicist I mentioned earlier points out that the principle of symmetry occurs in many, many places, including the Y chromosome. Many of its sequences are palindromes that read the same way forward and backward. Um, and anthropologists um, inform us that uh, Native American people, at least one particular group of Native American people, when asked what is their word for beauty, said aliveness is the, is the word for, for beauty. Um, so we're, we're uh, deeply at, at odds with this tradition of a life pact. And the life pact, it may again seem, well, maybe I'm being metaphorical. Really? That we're safe from, from where beauty is a plank in the midst of the ocean? Uh, it's, it's a rescue from a life-killing uh, sea? 
And I think the literal claim there is really twofold. One claim is that beauty restores a ground of trust under our feet. When things seem impossible and you suddenly see a beautiful sunset or uh, you know, a beautiful bird, it restores your, your trust and confirms uh, your own place in the world. And then second, um, and I think this goes along with your theme of attention this year, beauty demands from us a higher level of um, perceptual acuity or a vivacity of perception. Sometimes my students worry that beautiful things rob your attention from other things. So a beautiful vase deprives these vases of attention, or a beautiful person deprives these persons of attention. So I always suggest to them that they carry out the following experiment. The next time you're walking down the street and you're suddenly floored by a beautiful person, ask yourself, were you walking along the street being mindful and thoughtful about all the people you were seeing and enjoying uh, their features? Or were you very much in your own zone until this thing kind of hit you over the head and reminded you what a high level of perceptual acuity is? After which, I think it spills out to the rest of the world um, as a kind of, of wake-up call to bring us in touch with other things. Now, so far, it sounds like beautiful things contribute aliveness to us, but what, do we con what kind of aliveness do we contribute to them? And I think that there, there's um, an important way in which this is, this is true. Um, because beauty elicits from us the desire to protect and take care of the thing if it's already alive, such as a garden or a stream. And it gets us to confer the privileges of aliveness or life-likeness on the thing if it's an artifact. If a painting is stolen from a museum, as when the Vermeer painting was stolen from the Gardner Museum in Boston, or painting is stolen from the National Gallery in Berlin, worldwide people have concern for the surface of the painting as though it were a live creature that, uh, that the, where the damage seems intolerable. To become the steward or guardian or protector of it is the work carried out by museum curators, librarians, teachers, uh, but this act of stewardship is also carried out by the public at large. So the reciprocal conferring of liveness is a kind of life pact. You can see the part that beauty plays in the work of great environmentalists, um, probably first and foremost among environmentalists. Many of us would list Rachel Carson, um, whose Silent Spring began the um, revolution against pesticides and who has many books on the, um, on the ocean. She is herself a biologist, and yet she re re continually talks about the beauty of the world. In fact, in an essay of hers called The Real World Around Us, she cites the British nat naturalist Richard Jeffries with this statement. The exceeding beauty of Earth yields a new thought with every petal. The hours when the mind is absorbed by beauty are the only hours when we really live. All else is illusion or mere endurance. Um, even I wouldn't go this far as to say the hours when we're absorbed in beauty are the only hours when we're really alive. But the person who thought that did a lot for all of us uh, by the work she carried out uh, uh, against um, pesticides and inaugurating uh, the, the environmental movement and many other people such as John Muir who are successful um, preservationists uh, and many people in other countries who have carried out similar work have been inspired by the beauty of the world um, to extreme acts of, of protection. Um, and of course, uh, great, great poetry um, does this in part by reminding us that we have within ourselves the capacity for what the poet Alan Grossman calls obliterative rage. Um, he talks about the fact that in the Iliad, in the 24th book, um, we see Achilles wanting to destroy, not just kill Hector, but then destroy, efface, defile um, Hector's um, image. And the gods won't allow it. They put a golden cloud around Hector because they won't allow that kind of obliterative rage against the um, human form. And this tendency is there not only against human beings, 
but against the natural world. Uh, a piece of writing even earlier than the Iliad is Gilgamesh, and that very early epic describes Gilgamesh's destruction of the forest of the blue cedars. In his book on forests, Robert Harrison observes that the first antagonist of Gilgamesh is the forest. He goes to the cedar mountain to slay the forest guardian, Huawa. He asks, what is it exactly that inspires Gilgamesh to undertake this journey and deforest the cedar mountain? Gilgamesh complains that unlike the cedars, his own name is not high enough to reach the sky. Unlike the cedars with their vast forest expanse, his name is not wide enough to cover the earth. So he takes on this deed to make his name as high and as wide as the forest. In our own world, it may be in part a deep human resentment that our planet will outlive each of us and an attempt to inflict on the earth our own mortality that now uh, motivates the obliterative rage involved in, um, in, in nuclear weapons. Um, and the, I've t I, I want to go through each discipline, um, but soon I'll run out of time, so I'll just say quickly that as with poetry, so with law, um, we know that the uh, rights articles, such as the Magna Carta, are responsible for generating a lot of the rights we have. But um, the historian Peter Lindbergh points out that at the same time of the Magna Carta, there was another instrument called the Charter of the Forest, um, which made it clear that the, the wonderful um, fruits of the, and wood of the forest belong not just to the king and to aristocrats, but to all of us, and so too the obligations to preserve and protect the forest belong not just to kings and aristocrats, but to all of us. And the charter of the forest is seen today as to underwriting the public trust doctrine that is um, being used to fight global warming by um, staying the hand of deforestation. Uh, and it may also be of use in, um, in uh, the work of fighting nuclear weapons. Um, Bertrand Russell was a philosopher who existed at the beginning of the nuclear age. And in a book called Has Man a Future, Russell um, worried about the, um, about the, the uh, an understated word, he, he was in acute pain over the obscenity of the invention of nuclear weapons. And he imagines that the god of the underworld, Osiris, would decide just to eliminate human species for having created something so horrible. And then he imagines himself as pleading on our behalf to allow us to live. And what does he cite as uh, the reason why Osiris should uh, give us a second chance? It is, of course, the, our capacity to create <clears throat> beauty. He says, it's not only what to avoid that great men have shown us, they have shown us also that it is within human power to create a world of shining beauty and transcendent glory. Consider the poets, the composers, the painters, the men whose inward vision has been shown to the world in edifices of majestic splendor. All this country of the imagination might be ours, and human relations also could have the beauty of lyric poetry. For such reasons, Lord Osiris, we beseech thee to grant us a respite and a chance to emerge from ancient, follow, from ancient folly into a world of light and love and loveliness. Now, I want just in the last three minutes to talk about these two instances of graphic design. And uh, the first one is so familiar to you, I needn't say much, but what I'm thinking of is the peace sign, a line this way and two lines this way. And as most of you probably know, the peace sign, which many, many artists have seen as one of the great 20th century um, inventions in the realm of graphic design, um, is based on the semaphore flags for the letters for N and D standing for nuclear disarmament. Um, this gesture of holding flags is the N, and this is the D, and together they stand for nuclear disarmament. So when you see the peace sign, uh, it is in, in, it's a call to many things included in that is the call to disarmament. The second one you may be um, less familiar with, and that is the doomsday clock 
um, invented by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And the bulletin often, uh, though, though its writers are, all, are mostly scientists, often stresses the idea of beauty, as in this inside page that talks about a beautiful marguerite flower. And, um, and that, as I'm now quoting, everything, not everything important, um, but is not everything important encapsulated in this bud, color, growth, beauty. Aware of the dangers of nuclear war pressing upon us, many of us feel as fragile as this flower and as vulnerable, and as vulnerable but there is a way you can do something. Um, the inside cover of the January 1983 issue makes the same direct appeal to the pact of aliveness, this time with a leaf, and because of shortage of time, I won't read it. But it, it's extraordinary that they um, use the, a very delicate idiom of beauty, more delicate than anything I've said here tonight. But the major instance for the Bulletin of Atomic uh, Scientists uh, of, of their call of beauty as a wake-up call is the doomsday clock itself. Here um, pictured in a January 2007 cover with an earth in shadowed gray, its continents still identifiable um, but pockmarked as the moon by, um, by nuclear weapons. Um, and the, the um, brilliance of the Bulletin's clock is that it somehow accomplishes both a, a, an act of making us aware of the injuries that await us and of the beauty of the earth um, at the, the same time. Um, the clock, because of the elegance of the design, is a call to beauty um, and is um, well represented by uh, this image, but if we go back to the original simple image, which was made by a woman named Martel, um, you can perhaps grasp uh, what was involved in, in her invention. Um, one contemporary graphic artist, Michael Barut of Pentagon Design, has recently said that the doomsday clock might be considered the most powerful piece of information design in the 20th century. Um, by the way, the clock is now at three minutes to midnight uh, this year because of everything that's going on in the um, Ukraine and elsewhere. And, else, and, and elsewhere, the clock he writes takes all the contentious arguments about nuclear proliferation and translates them all into a simple, a brutally simple visual design. Um, would we all agree that it's the most powerful uh, piece of information design? Probably not, but I think we can certainly agree that it's at least one of the most important um, pieces of um, information. And I think that we can uh, see various reasons why this could be true. Um, and I think just because you have uh, promises to keep elsewhere, I will just go through these very quickly and not say all the things I would like to say. But this is the first run of images that occurred in the first decade where um, they just would keep finding different uh, pieces of color. And the thing about the, a, a circle is that if you only see a piece of it, it immediately conjures up the whole. So even by seeing a, a quadrant of the clock, you can, um, you can imagine the whole. Um, furthermore, the, the clock itself, uh, as I would like to elaborate if I had more time, is itself a beautiful invention, the clock face, that we now take for granted. Um, it has some problems with whether you uh, position the numbers uh, radially or whether you have them in an upright position. Uh, that would determine whether the six is right side up or upside down. Martel solved it by just using little circles um, so that the sphere itself is reenacted within this. Um, the, uh, eventually, the uh, designers moved to incorporating the sphere structure, as you can see in this image. Uh, sometimes a piece of, of, uh, of the outer space would be represented, sometimes a piece of geography. Here again is a, a celestial map. Sometimes it was a human figure. Um, this particular image was done by the original designer Martel. Um, in this case, we have a photograph of Lisa Meitner. Um, here was an optimistic year. By the way, I have to apologize for the stamp Cabot Science 
library. I had to scan these from the science library at Harvard, and they always had a stamp on the cover. So you just have to ignore that. Um, this next one, you can see the, uh, the sphere just in the midst of the uh, ducks flying at the top. Um, and here we're back to the 20th century where um, the combination of wisteria and the lit match um, conveys the, uh, the, the, both the, the possibility of grave, grave injury and the life-giving quality of, of beauty. Um, this one, again by Martel, a reference to global warming, um, shows the melting glacier and conjures up the whole planet's sphere. Um, even if only a core of the Earth is depicted, we can extrapolate and get the um, full planet in, in our mind hurtling through space. Even when digital time is used, I think we can hold on to the, um, the image. And um, here is the picture with which we began. Um, the shape of the Earth is like the shape of a clock face. It's very beautiful, and like Hardy's lunar eclipse or Kuramata's How High the Moon, um, it calls on us uh, for protection. Thank you. So, uh, and I'm happy to take questions, as I think we have the hall for a few more minutes. Yes. I'm curious um, about why or how or when you started seeing this connection between beauty and social justice, um, sort of like the origin story um, of this line of thought. You know, for, for, for a number of years, one of the reasons beauty was uh, not allowed in, in universities, um, and by the way, I should back up and say that it never disappeared from the sciences. Scientists always talked about elegant theorems and nice solutions and a beautiful calculation, but in the humanities, it did. And part of the reason it did was it was felt to, um, to be bringing a political harm. Um, and the, in, in the book that, um, that Silo mentioned um, on beauty and being just, um, I look at the explicit arguments, which are utterly incoherent, uh, that, that were being used against beauty. And um, the, the, had people stopped and elaborated those arguments, they would have seen in a minute that they were incoherent. But people didn't make the arguments, they just, uh, assumed it and uh, worked with the conclusion, which was, don't talk about beauty. And, and I don't just mean using the word beauty. I mean talking about the formal attributes of poetry or talking about how the structure of this works was, was really um, not tolerated for a while. And when I, when I wrote the book, um, I was trying to repair a problem within universities but then museum directors told me that they had been suffering under this taboo, and architects told me they had been suffering under it. People from art studios told me they had been suffering under it. So it was, and not just in the United States, in other countries, so it was widespread. So in order to bring beauty back, in order to bring beauty back, there was no way to, to just go and say, beauty for its own sake is enough. Forget whatever it does in the political world. As it happens, I actually believe with all my heart that beauty leads to um, a pressure to, to justice. And I don't mean within any one life. Like if you care about beauty, you'll be just. You, you may be a miserable, unjust person. But I mean glacially, over centuries. Um, why do we care about equality? Why do we care about just arrangements? It's because we see something like that in the naturally occurring instances of beauty. So I honestly believe that it does uh, actually lead to, to justice. But even if I didn't, even if I didn't, I, you could never get to the position of, of, say, art for art's sake. Like some of my colleagues say, forget about justice. Let's just like beauty. Yeah, we can't get there unless we do this first in order to oust that other thing. So I'm not doing it uh, just strategically. 
Um, I'm doing it because I really believe it. But without it, you could never uh, get, you know, get rid of these, these other arguments. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Traveling. Oh. I was going to say traveling microphones are available if it helps amplify the questions. Okay. Something that um, really helped me understand um, your talk was thinking about beauty um, in the realms of aesthetics and form, and form as a way of expanding our imaginary around what it means to be sort of what political engagement means, um, and the sort of like possibilities that um, that there are for political engagement in our everyday. Um, but something that I'm sort of wondering in relationship to your talk is um, this idea of beauty feels sort of vague in that it's, um, it seems to me that it's being talked to, spoken about both within its sort of um, specific and subjective context as well as in a more um, sort of like universal, universal um, idea. And so I'm sort of like, uh, curious if you could sort of tease that out or expand on that idea, if that makes sense to you? Or yeah. yeah, it absolutely does. So many people, uh, first of all, my, my own uh, leaning is towards the, the specific side. You know, that, that um, I mean, over the centuries there have been philosophers who want to talk about universal, that beauty is beauty if it's universally uh, judged to be beauty or it ought to be universally judged to be beauty. Now they have a hard time making that argument in part because it's untrue. Now that, in my view, because it's, it's, it's untrue. Um, and the, there are, I think, in, certainly instances of beauty that are universally held in common. I don't think there are probably people anywhere in the world who haven't noticed the beauty of children's faces or the beauty of sunrise. Um, but there are huge diversity of objects too and a huge plurality of objects. And, um, and people sometimes talk as, as though that's an argument against beauty. Well, you know, we don't have the same thing in this culture as in that culture. But what's crucial to see is that what's, what's universal is the love of beauty. Um, the fact that the objects of beauty differ shouldn't be a problem. After all, if each of us chose the same mate, we'd be in big trouble. So we, you know, we accept the idea of plurality. Even if we go to the much more easy to do thing, if each of us insisted on living in the same house, which we could do, uh, wh why would we do that? Um, and yet when it comes to this diversity, a plurality of objects in, uh, in, the, in the world, it's, it's often very um, troubling or, or it's, it's used. Now, the other strange thing about the, the, uh, the, the, the questions about universality is that um, during the time that beauty was not allowed in the classroom, um, the, the, it was often said that only middle class people cared about beauty. And I didn't even address that one in my book because I thought it was so self-evidently false that it only took 15 seconds of empirical experience to see that it was false. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, spend any time with an extremely wealthy person and you'll see that um, though there may be things that make you uncomfortable about that person, uh, they, they often are very attentive to beauty and equally so with very poor people. Um, they certainly notice the beauty of their children's faces. They certainly uh, wear bracelets and uh, or ornaments. What may be true in the class situation is that um, if you have more money and leisure time, you have more time for beauty. That's an argument for why we should have a better distribution of money. It's not an argument against beauty. Um, so I, I think that I think that there there are things that that are universal objects, but there are many many that that are are plural, and that 
you know, as in the instance of mates, ought to be plural. I think that there are many objects that, that are immediately available to all of us as beautiful. And then there are lots of objects, and this is one of the reasons we have universities, why it takes a lot of work to see the beauty of it, um, and, and where we can assist each other in finding the, um, the beauty of it. Um, and you know, in this lecture, I've continually uh, emphasized the way in which beauty presses us to a concern with justice. But um, in, the, in the book, I, uh, I also talk about its relation to, to truth and how it's not that something beautiful is itself true, but it, in, it incites in us a feeling of conviction that gives us a longing for finding abiding objects about which we can be convinced. That is, it incites in us the longing to find truth. So. Thank you, that clarified. Thank we have a question in the rear of the hall. Oh, up there. So, the, yeah. I have in mind um, a quote, which um, the kind of familiar quote from the anarchist Bakunin, uh, when he says, um, this, the impulse to destruction is a creative impulse. And it's, I know he's not talking just directly about beauty, but I don't think it's too much to, to say, knowing anything about Bakunin, that he, would, that he would find something very beautiful in the act of destruction, and that, the, that destruction of certain things is, is, there's beauty in that act. And so, um, I mean, I'm extrapolating from that a little bit. In my mind, I'm thinking um, that the destruction of, of some kind of harmony or order or um, the word you're using is symmetry that is um, obscuring either some deeper injustice or some, some more total injustice is, a, is the, I see beauty in that act. So my, my suggestion is that, that there's often something beautiful in destruction of symmetry. And I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of a beautiful palace um, of a corrupt government being burned as a beautiful thing. And I'm wondering how that might fit into your idea of beauty and justice. So, you know, the, the, obviously that's a, a topic that, that we should have a few hours to talk about. But, you know, briefly, I'd say, you know, two main things. One, there is a way in which, as Hegel said, uh, creation always involves some level of destruction. If you make a raft out of a tree, you have just destroyed the tree. If you introduce something, even if you don't harm the tree, the fact that you, you, what you have done is altered the state as it was by introducing a counterfactual and making it factual. So in that way, you've altered the world, and we could say you've destroyed the world that was. Um, and, and obviously, there are many, many cases of, of uh, creation involve, you know, obvious uh, cases of, of um, damaging something, as in the tree raft example. Um, but I think that that shouldn't be confused with uh, uh, the idea with which it often is confused, namely that um, that there's something that destruction can be an, an inflection, infliction of injury can be uh, a form of creation. I think that that's often a form of aping creation um, by bringing about the, the kind of, uh, you know, world effects of creation. And it's an important question that you're asking and one that really deserves to be talked about at length because often um, people who, who uh, you know, like uh, Marquis de Sade, will often be cited as a great exemplar of the imagination uh, because he would do things like, say, uh, he takes a sword in his hand and puts a little twig in the girl's hand and uh, tells her to defend herself. That's, that's the imagination? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, the, the, I think that that is a, a kind of inversion of um, imagination or creation. But there, there are features that it shares enough that it could cause this confusion. So I think it's, it's you know, important to, to sort them out. Um, in the case of, of taking down a palace, um, I don't think the destruction of the, uh, you know, the, the beautiful symmetry of the palace would be, uh, could be called beauty. But um, if, if, the, uh, if it's the residence of, of you know, that's sponsoring cruelty and inequity, 
then uh, its elimination could certainly be beautiful. Um, so you, somebody had a question over here. Um, yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so I was confused about the concept of symmetry, and maybe this is just an easy aesthetic or philosophical question, but like, why is it, how can you say that something asymmetrical would not be considered beautiful? Or like, in other words, like, what sort of perspective, what range of scale are you using to judge that thing's asymmetry and in someone's judgment of that, what are they not taking into account? Yeah, I don't think, I didn't, I didn't mean to say that we can't ever consider asymmetry beautiful. If I did, I misspoke. Um, but I think that the, the, the reigning uh, principle we want is symmetry, and then we can, if, you know, if our world is secure enough, we can even tolerate instances of, of asymmetry. Um, we don't want huge inequalities of, of income or huge inequalities of wealth. That would be um, very big asymmetry. And, and um, Now, to the people who hold the wealth, it, it may look beautiful. Um, and this is one of the, you know, I think this is why a, a kind of sphere is a good model of, um, of aspiration for equality. If you're, if you're in a kind of hierarchical structure, a pyramid, let's say the caste system in India or something, um, it can look beautiful if you're here at the apex, um, and it may look beautiful if you're standing outside it and like, uh, like pyramids. Um, there's an awful lot of locations in there where it doesn't look beautiful. Um, if, if instead you had a sphere where everybody was equidistant from the center, then no matter what position you stood in, it would look beautiful. And what I was trying to emphasize, and it's not as though, by the way, uh, this isn't a subject on which reasonable people can't disagree. So, you know, we, I, I, I was uh, part of a, a seminar on math and beauty, and um, several of the mathematicians were arguing for symmetry, you know, being so crucial and fundamental to, um, to, to math, and my colleague Barry Mazur says, uh, it isn't clear why it has to be. It just happens to be the case that every mathematical um, you know, proof is, is beautiful. Um, but then the physicist Brian Greene said, well, I think asymmetry, you know, look at the, the in the universe, if you go to uh, cosmology and so forth, there are lots of times where an asymmetry is functioning. So, you know, which one is figure and which one is ground? I, I want to just say that, that uh, you know, this room with its architecture is an extreme, or, or not extreme, it's just a straightforward example of symmetry. Um, if every step was uneven, uh, if every chair even, if every chair seat was uneven, it would do a much less good job of supporting uh, each of your backs. Um, and yet we can allow and enjoy some tremendous asymmetry in the midst of uh, the abiding fact of symmetry. It's just that, that the examples that are, are used of asymmetry are, you know, as, as I said when I was giving the face example, often tiny examples that um, don't register what would be true if you just extrapolated that and made it more extreme. Okay, thank you. Let's make this the, our, our last question. Um, two really interesting things happened for me in your lecture. And the first was um, when, you, when you actually were showing the images at the end and they were stamped with the library thing. And for me, like that really brought up the whole notion of like preservation and protection of beauty and how if humans sort of intervene in what is beautiful in an attempt to protect it or preserve it, how that can potentially be dangerous or like undermine the beauty itself. And then the second thing was that you said twice, you said something about the moon last night and something about rhododendrons on the way here. And I was wondering about like, if there's a difference between the way in which we experience and communicate beauty, and if that's true, like, 
I would think that you necessarily have to sort of like recenter humans. One of the most like beautiful things I think that you said was that beauty is about like a decentering of the human, but still like appreciating. I don't remember exactly how you put it, but about like not not making it about yourself, but right. still being able to recognize that something is beautiful. Right. And I wonder, like, in the sort of quest to have beauty lead to social ju- justice, if there's like a necessary recentering of the human or like an intervention and how that's potentially problematic to how that even works. So, um, I mean, that's an ingenious uh, identification of a problem. I don't think it's really a problem because with justice, it's not as though one person is benefiting from it. It's just a distributed situation. Um, and, uh, and in fact, everybody would have to, uh, you know, everybody would have to accept the, the uh, symmetry of their relations with one another and therefore would not be able to be the center of the world. So in a way, it's, it's a kind of ingenious question, but I don't think it's actually really a problem. Um, in the first question, yeah, I think often when we intervene to protect things, I mean, any act I carry out on my garden, and I carry out many acts of protection on my garden, and the moment I do it, I think, have I just done something worse? You know, it's, 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 it's and, and the example you gave of, you know, altering the covers, um, certainly people who work in museums worry all the time that some uh, chemical they're using to preserve it, then 10 years later or 100 years later, they have to remove that and so forth. So, you know, but that just shows that it's not an easy thing to carry beautiful things forward to the next, uh, you know, to the next generation of people. It's actually a very difficult thing um, and, and always has to be, you know, looked at and examined with care to see whether you're, you're really doing it or whether you're, you're, making it, uh, you're making it worse. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Scary, for a fascinating evening.